So for those of you guys out there, uh, welcome to the uh, inaugural Naked Wines live virtual wine tasting, live from my living room into your living room. Um, we're a little bit early at the moment, so just bear with us for another five to ten minutes. Um, due to some technical issues last week, we wanted to make sure that we were all over it this weekend. Um, so it appears it's working anyway. And um, I'm getting a few comments, so this is this is good to, good to see and good to hear. Um, I'm the the virtual guinea pig this week, um, so bear with me and also go easy on me. And I'm sure it can only get better from here anyway. I've um, got lots of people from all around the world have been texting and emailing me throughout the week, and um, yeah, sort of are joining in um, universally. So this is quite a unique tasting event. Obviously, we can't cheers and um, sit next to each other, but this is the next best thing. Hi Santina, thanks very much. Yeah, I've been rocking the uh, the Tom Selleck now for a few weeks, <laughs> much to the uh, amusement of all the people I live with. <laughs> um, yeah, my brother's involved now from, from the UK, so good to, good to see those guys up there. I suppose the beauty about uh, everyone working at home is that it doesn't really matter what time of, of day we enjoy a glass of wine. So uh, I hope you've all got something uh, yummy and tasty in your glasses. Um, you know that we are going to be tasting the 2019 Notice Tolland Chardonnay and the 2019 Army of Grapes Tempranillo tonight. So um, I will be tasting those, but I'm sure you can imagine how delicious they are going to be. And next time you do order some wine, you can look back on this tasting and and remember the comments and uh, the tasting comments made. Um, so we still are due to start in really another another five to ten minutes. But if you feel like um, firing some questions at me, that's fine. Um, if you want me to talk louder, I'll move closer. If you want me to talk quieter, I'll move to the back of the room. Um, so Santina, thanks Sahar. Thanks very much for your comment. Thanks for your support. Um, some pretty unique times we're having at the moment. Um, after a short week of work at home, we've got a, another weekend at home and then ready for another week at home next week. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, we're obviously experiencing all um, current events together and um, we've really just come out of vintage. So uh, for the last couple of weeks, it's been quite an eye-opening experiencing experience for us down here. Uh, vintage this year, was was awesome it was pretty warm um on the back of some some pretty extreme weather events the fires that these guys over those guys over east experienced uh some some pretty pretty phenomenal um vintage stories came out of that uh so yeah and, and obviously still still ongoing with what we're all experiencing now um but vintage wise over here in the west and the deep south so we we're in denmark so we're about four and a half hours south of Perth, about 450 kilometres, 500 kilometres, right on the south coast, um, which was once considered a cool climate, I suppose, uh, viticultural region. But at the moment, given current uh, sort of weather events we're experiencing, it seems to be more of a moderate Mediterranean climate uh, with a really early vintage this year. Uh, we, we harvested our vineyard around about two, two and a half weeks early, which was the earliest we've ever harvested uh, since we've 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 taken ownership over Carryview here, uh, which was which was good and bad. Obviously, great to get the fruit off, and it's always nice to have clean clean fruit. Um, you obviously also prefer longer ripening, much more more sort of uh, conducive conditions where the days are sort of warmer and warm, and the nights are nice and cool. But we tended to have some pretty warm days all at once uh, on the back of some some pretty dry conditions last year. So that, that sort of kicked off vintage quite early. Uh, I know the guys further north of us up in the Swan Valley around the Perth area, they, um, they kicked off vintage almost in 2019. So they, uh, they almost had a multi-vintage. So it's, um, it's some really, really weird times that we're experiencing at the moment. But, um, the, vintage, but the vintage was awesome and the fruit was fantastic. And I think uh, the picks for, for me this year are going to be probably Shiraz out of Franklin, um, the the Chardonnay and Pinot again off off Caribou here uh, are going to be really really excellent. I think they're going to be 
pretty big, robust styles, more masculine styles as opposed to more pretty elegant um, sort of styles that I suppose a cool climate Chardonnay and Pinot is, is known for or meant to, meant to be known for. Um, but I, I don't mind a bit of tannin, a bit of fruit and a bit of weight in, uh, in both those wines. Um, so, well, I suppose while well, we've got you all here and, and you guys are the early birds, it'd be nice to know um, who else is out there and where, you, where you're from and what you're drinking and um, how long you've been an angel and if you've tried any of my other wines, if you've got the Tempranillo and the Chardonnay tonight, um, are you pairing it with anything? I've got a pretty tasty little cheese platter here. I don't want to tip it up, otherwise it's going to pour out, but got some Pradera, a bit of Stilton. Uh, some some olives stuffed with parmesan, uh, a few crackers and some gherkins. This is um, still ongoing with the uh, the vegetarian diet on the back of a pretty um, big meat orientated tour to South Africa uh, last year with with Santina, who's um, already on here, um, and Julie, who was the other the other angel winner, who I've been told was uh, was disappointed this week because um, she has to go out. She has to go out. Well, she's on on another. Um, conference call with her mates having a, a virtual party but her partner Tim is around um, but yeah we had an awesome time over in South Africa and as you know some of those wines that we're making over there are now filtering through um, we've got the army of grapes Chenin Blanc Safari White which was made and produced in and around the Slangbrook region which is around about an hour uh, east of Cape Town uh, on the other side of the mountain so Quite a cool region um, in this little little valley, which is quite alluvial, very fertile, but grown up on these sort of rocky slopes and these old, really old bush vines, and produces some pretty intense um, fruit-driven whites and uh, yeah, some pretty big reds out there. But the Chenin Blanc is the biggest white variety grown out there, which was uh, really interesting um, for, for obviously the guys that came out. This is the the second year that we we ran the competition. Um, so really, really awesome to, to get that done and, and great to meet such wonderful people as always. And also, um, yeah, with Bree, another Naked Wine staffer came over and he got to experience that as well. So we're really hoping that this year gets to, gets to happen again and um, everything comes to uh, some sort of normality shortly and we can go, go back to our somewhat normal lives and, and um, enjoy each other's company on a more personal basis. Um, but for now, uh, this is what you've got. Um, this virtual tasting is going to happen, I think, weekly or bi-weekly. Um, I'm sure there's much more tech-savvy people out there, so um, amongst the, the naked winemaker um, community, and those guys will be all over it. So I think, um, yeah, you'll, you'll see some pretty awesome wines and some, some, some cool stories from winemakers all over Australia uh, and maybe even New Zealand, if, if, that's, uh, if that's what the plan is. Um, I know Santina, you, are, you guys are over in Melbourne. Um, hopefully you've got a few, uh, few glasses of wine ready for this evening. Um, some Shardy, some, some Tempranillo. As you know, we at Paul Nelson Wines through Naked, we make our two main brands, which are the Army of Grapes brand and the Notice Tollens range. Um, we also make and sell through our, um, our PN and Caribou wines. So quite a, quite a range of wines and styles that we do um, make for you guys. Um, a lot of unique uh, single vineyard stuff and then also a lot of geographical wines made and then wines blended across um, GIs as well. So yeah, quite a diverse um, range of wines and also styles and varieties. So. Yeah, hopefully you've tried a few of them and, and enjoyed a few of them as well. Uh, yeah, so I think what's well, five twenty-seven. We're still a little bit early, and, and I've been I've been chatting a fair bit. So I'd love to love to still hear some of your comments um, out there, uh, and what you're drinking, where you are, um, yeah, and what your favourite wine of our Army of Grapes wines are and and uh, what you've tried and also yeah what you've you've paired it with um, for me I think one of the other big things that we have sort of probably not really neglected to talk about so much on on maybe my winemaker thread even throughout you know really wine channels that in, in, in wine circles in general is the use of glassware um, 
and that's probably something I've actually concentrated more on in the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, really sort of researched a little bit in uh, in terms of what types of glass or stemware goes well with certain styles. Um, and so tonight I've, I've, I've got one glass going here at the moment, which is sort of a, um, a Burgundian type glass, which uh, is obviously quite suited to Burgundian styles and Burgundian wines, so Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but also lighter reds with a bit more tannin uh, and texture, um, but also Chardonnay as well. So yeah, really sort of allowing those aromas to, to emanate out of the glass, but also giving it a little bit of um, surface area for them to, to, to come out as well. And obviously you've got the champagne flutes, which uh, obviously have been yeah, quite well um, up as used throughout the throughout many years, but even champagne, I, I find, um, tends to taste different out of um, different types of, of glassware. Um, the, so the, the Chardonnay, yeah, I'll definitely be using the um, the Burgundian glass here. Um, if we've got uh, my little daughter, she's around here somewhere. If she's around and she's um, feeling up to it, she might grab another glass for the Tempranillo. But um, the the Burgundian glass will, will work just just fine. Um, so, but for Tempranillo, for, for something that's a little bit more robust and, and, and bigger in style, you know, something like a Cabernet glass, you know, works well. Um, and interesting enough, we actually did a tasting in, um, in South Africa last year with the guys that won the competition at a winery there called Boschendal, um, which is a really famous winery in, uh, in, in Franschhoek. And those guys do a, we did a, a wine tasting there and they basically paired um, wines with certain stemware. So we tasted, you know, Sauvignon Blanc out of a t certain type of glass and a Chardonnay and a Shiraz and a Shannon and so on. And um, it was quite quite an interesting ex experience and it was probably one um, of those, those sort of tasting experiences that at the beginning you don't really think is going to be that interesting just because, you know, you're more interested in the wine. Um, but, but to actually see... Um, those wines and how how they sort of do do taste differently and smell differently out of types of glasses is is quite interesting. So just wondering uh, if you guys experiment with that at all. Um, obviously, glassware can get pretty pricey and also um, pretty fragile as well. So you don't really want to be um, leaving them down low when you've got um, idle hands and and um, little kids running around the house. Even um, even washing them by hand after a couple of glasses of wine tends to be a little bit um, bit of a bit of a risk. Um, yeah, so I think um, we should probably look at starting the, the tasting shortly. Uh, let me know if you, you're all settled in and who else is here. I think we've got a few viewers just keep adding up as we go. Um, yeah, so yeah, again, really let, let me know where you are around Australia and um, yeah, how, how you guys are faring at the moment and what's in your wine stock. Do you... Um, do you have a glass of red, white on uh, on Friday? What's your preferred tipple? Um, for me, actually, I, I started tonight with a Negroni, as um, uh, I posted onto an Instagram feed. But always nice to end the week um, and start the weekend with a Negroni, one of my favourite cocktails, um, which is yeah, yeah, nice way to to begin proceedings. Um, and then yeah, going to obviously enjoy the Chardonnay and Tempranillo um, now. And then, um, yeah, actually, an early morning tomorrow. So not not a lot, not a lot of them either, because we've got the salmon running over here at the moment. So pretty looking forward to to going out salmon fishing tomorrow morning, and um, hopefully a little bit of chardonnay and, and uh, temp might be left over after we catch a few salmon. I'm going to make some salmon Thai fish cakes. Um, well, if we catch them. Um, so I suppose without further ado, um, I'd, I'd like to yeah really say thanks very much to uh, to you all for. Yeah, settling in and um, not getting out of your pajamas and making it to the living room—it's um, it's pretty tough. I know it's tough for a lot of us at the moment, and especially guys that are living in the city. But um, yeah, really, really happy that um, we're part of such an amazing community of, of wine drinkers and and wine lovers. And uh, to be yeah, to be making wine for you guys has been been awesome. I mean, it's been absolutely amazing up until now, and uh, I can't really thank you guys enough for all your support. Um, it means yeah, it means the world to us, and, and even just getting to those those tastings over in uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane this year for the uh, for the first time um, was was awesome and, and Perth again for the second time. So it just goes to show how much you guys yeah love naked wines, love the winemakers and, and love love what we do and 
I know not just I, it's all the other winemakers that um, are really, really thankful for your support. Um, so yeah, so so tonight, as you know, we'll be tasting the the Nodus Tollens 2019 Chardonnay and the 2019 Army of Grapes Tempranillo. So the Nodus Tollens Chardonnay was a 2019 vintage. Um, so from from Denmark. So all fruit sourced from <coughs> excuse me from from this vineyard and a particular another particular vineyard just down the road around about 5Ks. So we, for those of you that don't know, Denmark is, is a little sub-region within the uh, Great Southern uh, wine region. And the Great Southern wine region is massive. And um, yet there's obviously these small sub-regions that exist within it. And Denmark is one. Uh, and we as a, a winery and winemaker down here source from all those little sub-regions like Denmark and uh, Mount Barker, Peronga, Ups, Franklin, um, are our main ones and then also a little bit out of another region just north of us called Geograph which is where our Arnis and Gamay come from so a little warmer up there a little bit more conducive to those sort of Mediterranean styles um, but the, the the Chardonnay is um, yeah it's one of those wines that uh, we we I really love making um, and it's sort of it's built around the popularity of our Caribou Chardonnay and um, with a mind to sort of not go extreme oaky, but um, enough oak in there to really um, appeal to those guys that, or guys and girls that love love oak-driven Chardonnays um, with a bit of that um, malolactic character that gives it some texture and weight and some of that buttery creaminess and still still retains some of that lovely linear um, line of acidity too that, that you know, enhances freshness and length. And, um, you know, it to be one of those great, cool climate Chardonnays that um, slightly old school, but I think coming back in popularity now. We we make well we we make through for naked. We do um, three Chardonnays now. So the the Notice Tollens, which oh sorry four Chardonnays. So the Caribou, which sits at the more sort of hundred percent big oaky, really really extreme end of the old school spectrum. The Notice Tollens, which sits sort of just left of that with around about 50 to 70% uh, new oak, depending on the year. And we can chat about that as well. Um, and then we've got the PN Chardonnay and the Army of Grape Chardonnay, which um, tend to be um, less or, or no oak at all. Um, just again, depending on the year, but the PN Chardonnay is more of that sort of Chablis, re-searing, saline type of um, Chardonnay, which we want to emphasize more about that sort of freshness, that acid and, and sort of grape, grapefruit pickiness. Um, and all done in older oak, and then the the army of grape chardonnay gets a little bit of older oak and a small portion of new oak, and and more about that sort of fruit weight, and the fruit from that comes from Franklin River and uh, and Mount Barker, which tend to be two differing um, sub regions as well in terms of how the grapes ripen. Um, so yeah, so the, um, the well, we talked about the oak influence is that every year, obviously vintage wise, the the seasons do do vary, and um, while we do have a preference for type of oak and oak regime. Um, it's not um, exact every year because, um, as you know, with cooking, you know things tend to change a bit. Ingredients tend to change. The the type of tomato. Yeah, you know, if you're making spaghetti bolognese or your your beef, you know, you obviously you make adjustments accordingly, and that's pretty much the same with winemaking. So, um, in 2019, we we had a pretty um, great vintage. Um, in the, the year before 2018, which I, I would almost say was the best vintage in the last 10 years um, up until then. Um, but then 19 came and it was a really classical vintage. It probably um, sits somewhere between um, 2017 and 2018 in terms of um, elegance and, and, and sort of power and, and weight. So yeah, sort of lovely retention of acidity, but still some nice fruit weight, um, which, which I think produced a, a pretty a pretty um, elegant and classical Chardonnay but yeah with some some good length and some good weight so one that I think can can sell her well but yeah it's drinking quite well now um, and as with all Chardonnays um, it's it's always interesting to see how they do develop over time but that's that's something that um, yeah obviously we need to to look at and if you do buy a couple of bottles you know it's nice to drink one or two and and see see how the the rest age over time. I mean, especially on a screw cap, they're going to age well anyway. So we let's let's crack open the uh, the Chardonnay. <clears throat> I just actually took the, the screw cap off earlier just to make sure that it was all good. It's good. Uh, so yeah, so 2019, as I described, was a yeah, it was a great vintage. 
um, much more uh, cooler in terms of ripening, so a lot more drawn out than this year. Um, yeah, and so we, we we used around about, I think, 65, 70% new oak in, uh, in 2019. Um, it did have the fruit weight uh, to allow for that. It was uh, it was a pretty pretty awesome year. So it it yeah it does handle when the when the fruit ripens it, it sort of tends to handle a new oak uh, a lot better than, than than fruit that's a little under ripe or a little more um, mineral and saline and, and acidic. So yeah, so it's a pretty big whack of fruit, and that's why we do say on the um, on the wine that it's a it's an old school style Chardonnay. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those wines that it probably the styles of Chardonnay that, that really got me into drinking um, Chardonnay. And, you know, if you've ever drunk a bit of Chardonnay from, from Napa or from Burgundy or even from South Africa, some of those old school styles um, generally have yeah, a pretty good whack of oak in them and uh, tend to lean a little bit more sort of malolactic as well. So sort of that, that really buttery, brioche, um, hot buttered toast sort of characters you get in those wines, especially especially wines under cork. Um, so, yeah, so in the... Uh, the beautiful Burgundian glass. I think it's um yeah drinking really well now. Really beautiful, delicious, savoury, textural, and um, lovely sort of malo characters there. Um, the minerality and that acid really carries that wine, and I think um, that is a great wine. I think it's going to age for. For a number of years as well and i think while drinking well now and, and it's a really good food wine i think you know with obviously cheeses and um those types of light meats and white meats um you know fish and um yeah seafood salads or chicken caesar salads um even porks and and heavier sort of white meats it would handle um those those sorts of dishes too um, yeah, so really, I was really, really happy with this wine unfortunately in um, in Denmark here it's not a massive grape growing region. So we're always um, under the pump to try and find enough fruit, but at the same time, obviously, you don't want to to make too much of of a good thing, uh, and by by blending it away or trying to increase volumes just through you know adding extra chardonnay um, just to try and achieve volumes. And the same thing with Caribou, um, we always just make what we produce, and and especially um, we're seeing this year or being seen at the moment with these these warmer vintages and earlier vintages, um, lower yields. Um, and that was another factor of this year as well, uh, which obviously is one of those farming issues. You know, um, you you have to deal with the, the ups and the downs. And um, while quality was excellent, the quantity was down. I'd always prefer um, higher quality and lower volumes than the other way around. So yeah, so it's the same with and with the notice tolerance too. We we always aim to try and try and produce you know, a few tons of it, but it just it just depends on what the vineyards uh, this year produce. And this year at our Chardonnay vineyard, we were 50% down, which is always a little bit heartbreaking when you go and pick it. But um, it's always nice when you do pick it and it comes off and it's all always clean and green and healthy and fermenting away in barrel. And um, you tend to forget about those issues and you generally don't do the sums uh, anyway. So it's all about drinking the wine and, and the enjoyment, right? Um, so yeah, so the the 2019 Chardonnay Notice Tollens I think is an absolute cracker. The I had a look, look at the 2018 um, a few days ago actually after after tasting the 2019 um, last week, which you know, obviously had opened in in, um, in lieu of the failed uh, attempt to to talk to you guys. So um, yeah, just wanted to see how the 2018 was looking and uh, it it looks awesome as well. So. Just, yeah, still fresh and vibrant, and as as um, as though it was sort of a, a year young, a year older than um, a year younger than what it is. So, I think this this wine will hit in that same way as well. It's it's yeah, beautiful natural acidity. It's one of those things that I think we're blessed with down here. Um, yeah, so it's it's I suppose an inherent part of cool climate winemaking or or winemaking or growing the right varieties and regions that um, that people are tending to to see and to hear. To, to witness is that you know you do retain acidity and um, generally those are the better wines and those are the wines that, that tend to look a lot more integrated um, than wines that I suppose that have been shoehorned into their their region and and um, tried to be made according to a style or a plan um, so yeah so hopefully you guys are enjoying some of these wines I'm seeing a few comments oh yes should have been should have been um, scanning down. Uh, 
so yeah so sorry for not <laughs> for for not um looking at all your, your questions as they were the piling in i've just been talking the whole time um my brother asked what's the vintage looking like in the great southern well i believe i have answered that so thanks very much mate and um spike macca just got my first delivery looking forward to tasting thanks mate thanks for your support um Mary Barlow, hi from Melbourne. Hi, Mary. She's been an angel for a few years now. Love naked wines and drinking pin and noir. So do I. Thanks very much. Uh, David's enjoying our Tariga National. Thanks very much, David. Yeah, I mean, Tariga's one of those other varieties that has been um, widely grown in um, Portugal for, for a number of years and, um, yeah, grown alongside Tempranillo um, is also one of those um, varietals that goes into making port and is now quite a popular um, single variety wine and uh, one that we um, really yeah really fortunately got to got to get our hands on a few years ago and um, yeah made it in a, in a quite an interesting style and I think yeah it's it's drinking remarkably well now and I think will age uh, really well too um, got mum she mum's up in Saudi at the moment hi mum mum won't be drinking as you all know um, but I'm sure she's having a nice glass of sparkling prune juice or something like that um, hi Matt Awesome, thanks for that. Hi, Em, sister-in-law from Notting Hill. <laughs> uh, and she's asked, if you could drink any wine in the world right now, what would it be and why? Well, it would be the Nervous Tollens Chardonnay and the Army of Grapes Campanino <coughs> because I'm talking to all you wonderful people. Uh, Mary has, oh, she loves Negronis. I'm just catching up on comments now. Um, Dad is um, commenting from Saudi. How are you going, Dad? Hi, Danan, drinking this fiery white. Awesome, thanks very much. And you drank the temp last week. Great, and thanks for your comment too, I saw that. Um, yeah, sorry for being a bit lazy on some of my replies as well. Um, over vintage, we tend to get a bit snowed under with with uh, with fruit and uh, the, the responses to you guys tend to slow down a bit. So I apologize for that. Um, Jade Nelson, my sister, she's... Um, She's on the other side of Denmark at the moment with her brother-in-law. So they're down here with their kids and hopefully they're enjoying a couple of wines as well. Hi, Ali. Oh, you've got the Tempranillo. Great. Awesome. And can't be a good Chardonnay. Definitely not. Cheers, Ben. Thanks, Kelly Armstrong. Susan, John, drinking the 19 Riesling. Awesome. Um... Well, these are all great comments. Hi, Jody. You got the 18 and 19 Chardonnay to try. Excellent. And Heidi. Hi, gang. Hey, gang, Heidi. Heidi's and Jody, one of the uh, archangels. Um, Heidi's over here in WA as well. Um, big supporter of ours and regular commentator on all our wines. Thanks very much for all your support too. Hopefully you've got um, yeah some of these wines on the order. You've got the 17 Notice Tollens Pinot. Awesome. Um, yeah, last week we had a pretty pretty cool week down here. It was um, it was pretty miserable, so uh, it was actually perfect Tempranillo weather. Um, whereas today is was relatively warm. We we're experiencing a couple of days of, of really lovely weather. So it was around 23, 24 degrees today. Um, often the best time of year down in the Great Southern, just after summer. Um, yeah, warm days, cool nights, and um, no wind. So perfect for for drinking and also perfect for fishing. Um, I'm Ellie drinking. Drinking a naked wine tonight, enjoying the sunsets. That's awesome. And are you guys all um, Eastern Staters or, or Queensland, uh, WA, Tassie? Uh, I know you guys are all scattered around the country, and um, well, most of you are all over in the Eastern States, but um, our, this, us sand gropers are catching you slowly, slowly, but surely. Um, had a pretty awesome tasting with, with you all last year um, through the, the Naked Wines Roadshow up through um, Sydney and Brisbane. And then um, to sunny Queensland, which was awesome for the first time. Um, really cool to see all the different, um, you know, people and how they approach wine. And uh, I suppose climatically really makes a big difference as well. Um, yeah, and what sort of wines we do drink. I uh, apologise for the noise upstairs. Let's um, put my little daughter throwing shoes around. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... How do you rate Italian Chardonnays? 
Uh, yeah, Brett, I rate them, rate them quite highly. Obviously, Italy probably wouldn't be up on the radar for many people in terms of uh, when they're selecting a Chardonnay, but obviously there's a few interesting um, regions now in Italy that are producing Chardonnay. Um, through Tuscany, there's there's some guys there, and actually some of my favourite Chardonnay is um, up in the north of Italy in Piemonte, where we had a chance to uh, to visit last year through the uh, Naked Wines Winemaker Fantasy, which was which was awesome. Um, yeah, and obviously that region there grows uh, reds quite widely: Nebbiolo, Barbera, Dolcetto, and uh, a little bit of Arnese as their main uh, main white. Uh, but some of the guys there are also planting a bit of Chardonnay and, and doing a damn good job of it. And uh, one of them, if you ever get a chance to to try, is um, from a producer called Conterno Fantino. And he uh, he makes a pretty old school style Chardonnay and does a lot of leaf stirring in the barrel. So it produces a really rich style um, and obviously being quite a cool area and quite high up in um, in the region there, high up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the hills, they tend to be quite um, minerally and, and saline and great acidity too. So, yeah, pretty, really interesting wine and quite eye-opening for me. Um, Tom Milligan, love you, Mo. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Kelly, Perth local. Diane, cheers from Perth. Cheers, Tom from Sydney. Ben, Bondi, hope you're not at the beach. Diane, thanks for that. Love the Arnese. Love Arnese too. Thanks, Ali. Love my hoodie. Ali Craig, look forward to trying some of your wines. Thanks, Ali. Yep, and thanks all to all your support as well. Obviously, means means the world to us. And um, and even and getting to answer all your questions and and and, and hearing the feedback is actually one of the best parts of of um, of being a naked winemaker. We don't actually, as winemakers, usually get that opportunity to to interact directly with uh, with consumers. It's usually done through intermediaries, so through retail stores or through restaurants and. Yeah, you never usually uh, hear the comments and the feedback from from you guys out there drinking it, and that's one of the many benefits that us as winemakers through Naked really get to get to enjoy, uh, and often sometimes can actually even tailor certain styles of wine. So if we're hearing that you know you like oak or you want certain um, levels of acidity, you know it really can dictate how some winemakers um, yeah can push push certain styles of wines and. Um, and as you know, you know Chardonnay, Riesling. They, there's so many different styles of those wines, and it can be quite hard to to really pinpoint one style and appear to 100% of of the Chardonnay drinkers out there. But um, I think the way that we approach it through the through the naked process of of buying and and enjoying wines is that you know you do separate it through unwooded, lightly wooded, uh, big oaked, and mallowed and and generally, that, those flavour profiles, um, you tend to learn and, and tend to sort of steer towards. And even geographically, you know, if you're going to be buying Chardonnays from, say, Denmark or Tasmania or New Zealand, you know there's going to be some um, pretty acid-focused Chardonnays. Um, and then you see sort of Chardonnays maybe a bit, from, a bit further north in WA. So like Margaret River from, from say, Nigel Ludlow at, at Evoy. You know, those guys produce some awesome Chardonnays up there, but they tend to be... A um, little bit richer, um, possibly a little bit more fuller bodied, um, but it just goes to show you the great diversity that we we have um, within Australia um, from Chardonnay or from a Chardonnay perspective, and that probably goes um, the same towards Riesling um, and Shiraz too, which I think you know three of those varieties, you know, are, are probably some of the, my top three drinking wines, um, and Pinot Noir as well, um, but obviously not widely as grown as as, um, as Shiraz and Chardonnay. Um, let's see some more comments here. Yeah. Santina, we love the army grapes, Shannon Blanc. Thanks very much, Santina. Cheers, and um, I hope you. I know you've got a few bottles there as well, and um, I know you're wishing to uh, win another gig on the Great African Escape Wine Safari again this year. I know you willed it to happen last year, so who's 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 um, lightning strikes twice rarely, but it does strike twice sometimes. So good luck with that, um, Hayden. Best wine for a butter chicken. Um, well, funnily enough, actually, in curry or spiced foods tends to be one of those um, really hard um, cuisines that people struggle with when it comes to wine pairing. Um, 
and I actually did a six month vintage up in India uh, back in 2007. And um, it was quite an eye-opening experience when um, when trying to talk to people up there about you know, wine and how you how you enjoy it with food. And one of my main jobs outside of vintage was to visit the main cities in India and um, talk to, to to drinkers there and restauranters and restaurateurs and and um, and customers and talk to them about how um, wines are the way they are and and what wines are probably best. Uh, served with certain types of food and um, and obviously Indian food uh, it, it does vary but obviously spicy and um, yeah it can be quite creamy and can be quite um, flavoursome um, and the same can be said actually through you know so through France and some of those sort of northern regions of Italy where they tend to be quite rich cuisines as well um, so for me yeah so just for for your, for your question Hayden for a butter chicken um, you know I'd be looking at at something that has a bit of bit of acidity um, possibly a Riesling um, with a couple of grams of sugar in it. Um, maybe even a, you know, a, a richer Chenin Blanc that um, possibly been barrel aged. Um, and red wise, if you're going to go reds, I'd go probably a lighter red, maybe maybe like a Gamay, the, like the ones we make, the PN Gamay, which I think you can chill down a bit. Um, has a nice crunchy acidity and can handle, um, handle a bit of heat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and possibly even Pinot, but yeah, it's it's certainly an, an interesting um, point. That is, is is how many wines do pair with certain types of food, and you know, really, you, you don't have to shoehorn you know Cabernet and steak. It's it's not like that anymore. Um, it's it can be quite varied, and you know, a good Chardonnay can still go with a good steak. So it's it's sort of a pretty interesting um, experiment to have amongst yourselves anyway. And um, often, sometimes you're quite amazed at what wines do pair well with certain types of foods. So, yeah, good luck with that, Hayden, and hope the butter chicken um, goes well for you, mate. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Vivian, have a bottle of Army Grapes Pinot Noir ready to crack on the weekend. Keep up the great work. Thanks very much, Vivian. Um, I'm, hope, I'm assuming that's the 2019 Pinot Noir, which is our current uh, vintage. Looks, uh, yeah, that looks awesome. Um, really, really great year for Pinot. Um, lots of fruit, but uh, good retention of acidity too. So I think one of those years that really over delivers on the, um, on the red wine front. Yeah, you do want fruit and, and mid palate weight, and um, that was that was fortunately one of the things that we got to uh, enjoy last year. Um, Santina, nearly all gone. Yes, I've entered again. <laughs> okay, awesome. Will you be taking Austria again this year? Uh, Heidi Sablonk is my fave. Yeah, cool. It's Sablonk. <coughs> excuse me. Sablonk is my uh, one of my favourite wines too, actually. And funnily enough, it's sort of one of those wines that does get a bit um, of a bad bad rep, given um, given the I suppose the volume of Sablonk that has been produced in the past. Um, and I suppose there have been varying degrees of quality, but it's certainly one of those varieties that does grow um, or does do well when it's grown in the right regions. And um, certainly from a Western Australia perspective. Yeah, you can't go past um, some of those Margaret Rivers Sauvignon Blancs, and um, they tend to be a bit more tropical uh, and passion fruit flavoured. While while um, the the Sab Blancs down here in the Great Southern tend to be a bit more grassy, herbaceous, and lemongrass, um, a bit more sort of those sort of Loire style Chenin Blancs. Whereas, yeah, the Mar guys tend to be a bit more sort of that Grave south south of Bordeaux sort of style. Um, but yeah, great great wine. It was that was our first wine that we ever made. We made. Um, Five tons of Chenin Blanc back in 2000. Uh, sorry, Sauvignon Blanc back in 2009, and uh, we lightly oaked it, and it got best one of the best new wines in uh, in James Halliday's book. So we're pretty pumped with that. Uh, it's always one of the always one of the wines that does does quite well for us. And um, to that last year, 2019 was the first year that we did a Sauvignon Blanc for for you guys for Naked, and uh, we made it in that similar fashion, um, exactly the same vineyard, which was awesome that we 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 harvested or we. We um we picked from in 2009, so um 10 years later, yeah, we got to to make another wine from that same vineyard in the same manner for you guys. So, yeah, really cool, and um I hopefully you enjoy enjoy that. Um, a couple more comments here. Of course, Oscar. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll let if you're following um any of the comments, you guys on the on the stream here. Um, Santina and Oscar. Oscar were two of the uh, the guys that came on the 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 tour last year and um, Oscar had the misfortune of, um, of biting into a, a toffee candy at the top of Cape, Cape Town in um, Octable Mountain and um, unfortunately had a bit of a mishap with his teeth. <laughs> what would you pair with a Tempranillo? 
Um, good question, Dave. I, well, let's get on to the Tempranillo. Um, we can drink your, drink your Chardonnay or you can put in a spittoon. Or you can drink it. Um, I'm not driving anywhere. Well, I hope you're not. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> 2019 Army of Grapes Tempranillo. Uh, our first year making Tempranillo for you guys. Um, Tempranillo, as I discussed a little earlier, uh, from one of the from the earlier comments, is a, a Portuguese, uh, well, a famous Portuguese red variety, also grown quite widely in Spain, um, in Priorat. So, um, sorry, not Priorat, in Rioja, in the north of Spain. Getting my uh, my geographies mixed up, um, but yeah, it's 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 one of those versatile reds. Um, obviously, made as a as a still table wine. Um, we also do a, a rosé. Um, our army of grapes rosé is made from Tempranillo too. And um, and obviously Tempranillo is is a variety used in port making in Portugal, um, so it can be quite leathery, it can be quite tannic. It, it does depend on where it's grown, how you how you grow it, um, when you pick it. Um, it's a pretty pretty um, big producer of fruit, so uh, that can be an issue in the vineyard. So you need to watch crop levels, uh, making sure that you do do um, drop a bit of fruit, especially when you're producing still table wine. For rosé, uh, having a little bit more, a bit more fruit on the vine is not a bad thing, because you don't want to be concentrating all the all that fruit and tannin. Um, you, you sort of want more of a sort of a lighter style, and having a little more fruit, having a heavier crop, a heavier crop tends to do that. Um, so yeah, so David Tempranillo, well, let's have a little look at it first. 2019 was, as I just discussed, was a pretty awesome vintage. Um, yeah, a, a great year to 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 talk about and to think about doing a new wine and, and luckily we were blessed with um, yeah, such great conditions. Um, <clears throat> the the Tempranillo we made last year was quite interestingly a, uh, a blend from Ferguson Valley and Margaret River. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of um, multi-regional blends and it's certainly something I think you shouldn't shy away from, especially when you're picking the eyes out of you know, really great vineyards. Um, yeah, it, it tends to, they tend to marry so well together and um, that year, it worked, worked perfectly and Ferguson Valley tends to be, um, which is quite close to Mark River, about sort of 50 to 60 k's away, but it tends to be quite high up. So really cool nights, but but warm days, whereas Mark River is, was a bit further down and quite coastal um, and is obviously a bit more um, moderated by the maritime conditions it experiences there. Um, yeah, so we got to, to harvest two, two batches of fruit that year. Um, uh, really interesting fruit. It was all hand-picked, both batches, which I think is important, um, especially when making you know, conscious decisions when it comes to um, you're using a bit of whole bunch in fermentation, which is what I like to do with the Tempranillo. Um, so we, we put around about 10% whole bunches in there, which which is the whole bunch of fruit, basically. We, we chuck that into the bottom of the fermenter and then we crush the rest of the fruit on top of it. So that, that whole bunch um, volume of fruit on the bottom um, is obviously under that crushed fruit, but it does its own fermentation within the berries and it actually produces some different styles and different characteristics. And some of you might know uh, Gamay um, or Beaujolais. Gamay is one of those famous varieties that um, is made through carbonic maceration, which is basically 100% whole bunches in a, in a pressurised vessel and it does its own thing in there. And all those little tiny berries um, do their own little fermentations and uh, it, can, it produces these lovely sort of um, vivacious Beaujolais sort of bubblegum characteristics, which you just don't get when you when you macerate the skin. So the idea of, um, of doing that with a Tempranillo was that we didn't want to produce um, a Tempranillo that was massive, um, hugely tannic. Um, and so we wanted to produce a wine that was yeah, um, really easy drinking, soft, um, had some texture and some um, some weight, uh, but, you know, could handle a chill as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Hopefully some of you have tried it. Um, have a look at some of the latest comments. Um, Food-wise, I, with Tempranillo, um, you know, really strong cheeses. So, um, for, for instance, you know, as an aperitifo, you know, it, it's a, a chilled glass of Tempranillo in the fridge um, before dinner or before another wine. Um, you know, Stilton handles um, those sorts of um, foods quite well. 
otherwise, you know, obviously stock standard um, staple um, lamb chops or, you know, sort of barbecue foods. I really love um, just a good homemade pizza with, with this tempranillo. I find it a really, you know, what I would say a gluggable style of wine. It's one of those sort of uncomplicated, really easy drink, drinking reds that, um, you know, you, you don't really have to think about. It's um, And to me, some of the best wines, you know, I've drunk are wines that you, know, you just... Um, you just drink and then you think, oh, bottle's gone. And, you know, that's, that, that generally means to me that you've enjoyed it without actually having to think too, too much about it. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, hopefully there's a few of you guys out there that are drinking Tempranillo tonight um, or have got this, this particular wine uh, in your glass. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Nadine. I'm drinking a glass of the Rosé, which, which is Tempranillo. So, um, perfect for for the uh, for the evening, uh, and also I mean rosé is is sort of one of those styles of wine that um, is is almost a 365 year a day um, wine. You know you can drink it um, through throughout winter, throughout summer, spring, and um, it, it does well. You know really chilled or room temperature, and does well with a wide varieties of foods. Um, funnily enough, it, it's sort of one of those variety or one of those styles that has taken quite a while to really take off um, in Australia, whereas in the UK, in Europe, it's, it's quite widely enjoyed and, um, and is, is enjoyed throughout the year, whereas um, it's taken you know, a few years for that to filter through to Australia and we're probably really seeing you know, the benefits of that now um, with, with a lot of great rosés being produced around Australia um, and very different styles too because obviously rosé can be made from um, very different Red wines. Um, some of the some of the rosés are also made with a bit of white wine, um, and the types of winemaking used to produce um, rosés was also um, was also varies quite a lot as well. Uh, I'm not too sure if you had the chance to have a look at um, our PN rosé, which um, we also sell through the Naked uh, website. But that is a um, Pinot Noir Chardonnay rosé, and um, funnily enough, that came about through um, to our tour into South Africa. Uh, a couple of years ago when we were tasting through a winery there called Haute Cabriere and they um, they were producing a rosé there which was made with Pinot Noir and a little bit of Chardonnay and they were making 2 million bottles of that a year. So I thought, oh, well, if I can make 2 million bottles a year over there, we should be able to make a couple of hundred. So so we did and um, it was it's a really interesting style. It's probably, um, in the past, I've always done very red-focused rosés and it was a, a new... Um, a way for me to approach uh, a winemaking, um, a winemaking, I suppose, method, and um, we fermented the whites and the reds together, and yeah, it worked really well. I was really happy with it. And I think um, that that inclusion of, of Chardonnay, especially, which I mean, when we look at some of the uh, the great champagnes of the world, they're they're Pinot and Chardonnay based anyway, but obviously with bubbles, and they taste delicious. So if you've tried it, um, hopefully you um, yeah, hopefully you've got some comments as well. Um, uh, and also sort of a little bit of a segue to that as well. Our, our PM wines also all have playlists on the back of them. So there's a Spotify code there. And so if you, um, if you get, your, get your Spotify uh, app, open it up, take a picture of it, it'll, um, it'll take you to its own soundtrack and you can listen to what the wine sounds like uh, and hopefully you can pair it with something delicious as well. Um, we enjoyed the past bolognese pasta, Danan. That sounds awesome but really nice on its own, of course, pairs well with cooking your meal. Awesome. Well, as the great chef Floyd used to say, if you can't drink it, don't cook with it. <laughs> um, Tom, Tempranillo is my favorite. Cheers, thanks mate. Yeah, I love a good temp. Um, and yeah, Tempranillo is growing so well and, and widely in Australia. It's, it's, it's becoming a really popular um, variety to grow and to drink in Australia. And, I think also a great wine, a great variety that can be blended to. So really interesting with Shiraz um, yeah, inclusion. It does offer some really sort of um, opulent fruit characteristics. So it can it can sort of round off wines that are a little bit more tannic. Um, yeah, and, and, and it, it's it's sort of one of those really versatile um, wines that are quite hardy as well and can can handle sort of extreme levels of heat, which. I think the way that we're going uh, in Australia and the way that we're seeing the world go climatically, um, we are going to have to look at more 
um, I suppose heat sensitive or le le less heat sensitive varieties, um, you know, varieties that can handle um, some warmer vintages and retain acidity, which is which is what wine making is all about. We want to be as minimal um, intervention as possible, and and the one way of doing that is actually choosing the right varieties to go in in the region that we are. And um, yeah, we're seeing that, and I think adaptability is going to be one of the um, ever present things uh, amongst the winemaking community. Tom, finish, finish your glass. Yeah, no worries. Let's have a taste of it anyway. Pretty, pretty damn delicious. Um, I mean, for a wine that I can't remember what it retails for on Naked, but it's like pound for pound over the livers. I love just drinking an easy drinking red that you can just, you know, drain a glass of and, and you know, have another and, and enjoy, you know, some pizza and pasta and, um, and, and just, you know, some good music. And this is definitely one of those wines. And I think um, we probably should have done a few magnums of it because it's like it's your typical party, party red, I think. Yeah, it's um, great to have on the table. Lots of people enjoy it. I don't think, um, yeah, it, it would uh, rub too many people the wrong way. It's just all about just drinkability. And I think it, um, it achieves that. Lots of fruit on the, the mid palate. It's got some um, lovely fine um, tannins on the side. Uh, and then just with that sort of fresh fresh, uh, fresh acid finish, which carries, you know, those sort of um, vibrant red fruits and strawberry characteristics. And um, yeah, sort of there's just lovely, lovely, delicious um, fruits of the forest um, characteristics that, that Tempranillo can have. Um, yeah, so it's, it's probably uh, one of those wines tonight that is not gonna be left um opened for, for that long um let's see got some more comments coming through here uh, what are the benefits <clears throat> from making wine in amphora um well yes i mean funnily enough i mean we've talked about oak and um its influences on on chardonnay it's certainly one of those things that um, that we see quite widely in the winemaking industry. And as winemakers, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty cost um, sensitive part of the business when we when we do use oak, um, and especially when we're talking about wines that we want to release within sort of 12 to 15 months. Um, yeah, we don't want to be adding a whole lot of new oak either, um, because generally wines that go into new oak, you know, you're sort of looking at, at keeping them in in oak for at least 15 months or more. Um, and obviously certain certain percentage of new oak as well. So wines that are, are being released earlier generally aren't receiving a lot of a high percentage of new oak. Um, I mean, with this this Tempranillo as well, we we actually like to use a lot of old oak, which um, which is really important, I think, in retaining um, that freshness and varietal typicity. Um, we certainly don't want to <coughs> increase um, that oakiness and um, and and to bombard the palate with with too much oak. So we we tend to use a lot of older oak, some big format stuff. Um, I like to leave leave a little bit on lees as well, which which can enhance um, mid palate freshness, mid palate weight. Um, and as Brett was saying, um, benefits of amphora. We don't actually use any amphora in the Tempranillo, but we do use uh, amphora in the Gamay that that you guys um, hopefully have had a try of. Uh, we also use it in the Arnis. And um, it's just another format, another fermentation vessel, another another way of, of, of um, I suppose, manipulating fermentation of maturation. Um, it's it's quite obviously an organic product. It's all clay. Um, to me, it's great because you can use white and red through it. Um, whereas oak, obviously, once you've um, you put red wine in oak, you can't you really you can't really turn it back to. Um, to to white. I'm just going to plug in my um, battery because someone's been talking too much. Um, yeah, so sorry about this. There we go. I'm in the I'm in the children's play area now. <laughs> um, so oak, yeah, is obviously pretty important. Um, and amphoras uh, are quite a new uh, vessel that a lot of people are playing around with. They're very expensive um, and probably not ones that are going to be huge um, portions of, of blends, but uh, really, really unique and interesting um, parts of, of, of wines that um, 
yeah, in, in small quantities. So the yarn ace that we make is around about 30% um, amphora made and it just tends to enhance a bit of freshness or re retain freshness, I should say. Uh, and even the way that they're, they're sort of shaped, they have a, a sort of a round, robust um, body and they tend to keep the, the kinetics of the, of the fermentation and even of the wine when it matures um, in constant movement, which allows the wine to sort of increase its, um, increase its volume in the, in the mouth and um, add a little bit more weight. So hopefully uh, that answers your question, Brett. Am I moonlighting? Uh, with the, the moon behind me, you mean? <laughs> um, oh, hi, Susan, you listened to the Spotify today. Uh, what soundtrack did you listen to? Hopefully you enjoyed it. There's some pretty eclectic mixes on there, so it's, it's a bit of a, um, uh, a buckle up and, and sit back and, and let it wash all over you type scenario. Uh, Tom, have the bushfires affected my produce? Uh, your produce pulled the wall. Um, no, no, it hasn't. And we, we obviously had bushfires over here in the west. Uh, but we were lucky, lucky enough to be further, far enough away from them. Uh, they were a little further north uh, and nowhere near as bad as what the guys over east experienced. But I know there, there have been a couple of vineyards that were next to those fires uh, and they have had some issues with smoke taint, but not to the extent that um, we're seeing uh, over east. Um, yeah, it seems to be another function of of climate change, we're seeing yeah you know, an increased risk of fires, and it's yeah I'm not too sure what the the key is there. Um, there seems to be arguments for and against burn offs, and um, yeah how we approach managing those issues, and it it's probably one that's not going to really appeal to to everyone at once. And um, as as farmers and as as vineyards, it's um, an ever ever present risk, and it's one that we all feel when um, when someone experiences something like that, it's it's quite devastating. Uh, I'm not too sure if you've ever tasted a wine that has been smoke affected. It's it's not not pleasant, um, which is why obviously a lot of vineyards and wineries chose to just leave fruit um, on the vine or, or just drop them on the ground this year because it just yeah it's just not worth the risk of putting something like that in bottle, which is which will damage reputation and. And obviously, the risk of not even being drunk. So um, that's that's something that obviously, as a winery, you have to make that call. And is um, there's a huge risk um, associated with that too, from just sales. Um, David Warren, fire truck on standby on the shelf. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Susan Pinot Noir soundtrack. Oh yeah, great. Yep, I like the Pinot Noir soundtrack. My favourite's the uh, the Tariga at the moment. It's a bit flamenco, and um, I actually yeah, it's 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 quite hip and uh, enjoyable on a Friday afternoon. So give that a go next time you enjoy the Tariga National. Um, yeah. So uh, if had any comments on the the Tempranillo? Have you guys um, had a try of that? Um, if so, or if not, um, any other Tempranillos in Australia that you've tried, or is, is Tempranillo a red wine that you haven't tried? Um, what are your favourite reds? Um, I know Shiraz is, is obviously probably one of the, the most favourite reds out there. It's certainly the, um, the most widely grown uh, red variety, but uh, I think we're seeing um, a bit of a, a resurgence from some of these alternatives like Tempranillo and Grenache. Um, you know, I suppose probably one's been considered more of a commercial or, um, or sort of second tier type wine, but um, yeah, winemaking techniques, viticultural techniques have improved, and now we're seeing some um, some pretty pretty awesome um, examples of those varieties coming out of Western Australia and South Australia. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty cool to to see. Um, it's also good to to see you know, as an Australian winemaker and wine grower that we have that flexibility. You know, we're not really stuck into um, or shoehorned into specific wines or varieties like um, like those guys are up in France and um, and and Italy, where they obviously need to, to be growing certain types of of, um, of varieties, which which is good um, in a way because it does you know it does um, does typify a region and um, and it can add extreme value to those wines. But it also um, you know like we were talking about climatically, um, we're seeing you know these weather events and changing climates and 
when you're a bit shoehorned into a certain variety, it can um, it can be a bit of an issue, which um, you know, we're beginning to slowly see, um, especially in certain areas like in Bordeaux, which obviously is a very Cabernet-dominated um, um, region. Um, but those guys you know, are now looking at um, other wines or other varieties that they can possibly look at planting to help try and prop up um, prop up those wines and um, some interesting times ahead. Um, hi, Jules. Jules has joined. She's um, she's finished her, her zoo party and um, she's ready to go. Uh, Dave, not yet, but you're awesome. Thanks very much. Oh, great, Jody, and join the temp and shut the gates from Clare Valley. I haven't tried that yet, but I've heard it's excellent. Goes good with lamb. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> well, um, I, I haven't tried any lamb for a while. Yeah, as I, I said um, earlier, I'm still still going the full veggie at the moment, but um, I think when my birthday comes around next uh, next month, I'm I'm going to be enjoying um something a little uh little meatier um and probably a temporary might go well with that so i'll i'll keep you informed um yeah so any other any other comments on the shardy or the temporary um actually probably another interesting factor in, in in wine on wine drinking is something that we just recently discussed is is music and part of the reason why we decided to um, pair or, or list a playlist on the back of, of our wines uh, was that you know often more often than not you do listen to music and it's always in the background and it's certainly another sensory perception that um, that I have um, when I'm enjoying wine and we thought that you know instead of you know talking about food with wine we would talk about music with wine um, it's obviously a very personal thing um, and if you have listened to some of the soundtracks on there you'll realize that um, yeah, they're they're pretty weird. Some of the um, the selections, but they're pretty awesome too. So it, it sort of it came it came about by just a chance discussion I had with a good mate of mine, who's actually an angel as well. And um, he was he's a DJ or is a, a DJ by night um, and um, fly and fly out by day. But he is first and foremost passion is music and has an extensive collection. And every time we get together, we always talk about wine and 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 sort of how. The music affects it, and I suppose it's it's sort of this slants to um, the biodynamic sort of um, discussion as well in terms of how you know wine changes um, on certain days and um, and how your mood can influence you know taste or how you know you know, you, you feel about a certain wine one day and it, it changes the next day, and um, I think that's that's pretty true you know and um, it it does have a big influence and for me. Music is, is a big part of that as well. So um, if there's a, a certain type of music you enjoy with a certain type of wine, let me know. Uh, I And Jody, yep, um, Jill Smith. Hi, Paul. Nice, nice, nice tash. It's nice stash. Yep, thanks very much. Um, Daryl, um, congrats, Pina is an absolute stunner. Also second attempt, amazing with lamb. Awesome. Can I just grab my glass? Um, yeah, glass, thanks. My batteries. <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. That's all happening um, at the farm at the moment, as you can see. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, to me, every time I look at this wine, I see this sort of these amazing purple, vibrant hues, and um, it just looks so delicious and inviting. It's sort of one of those those wines that um, you know looks really amazing in the glass, and you know it's got a heap of you know sort of red and black fruits in the in the glass, and um, yeah, it it definitely does have that. So hopefully, you see that. Um, what else, Jules? Who writes the playlist? Well, yeah, good mind of mine, um, who prefers to remain anonymous because um that's the way he rolls but he yeah he you can follow his his dj his um his his um his account on spotify it's 404 object and um he's got a number of other uh playlists and soundtracks there that which he does all right i think we've got enough battery there That's me, me talking too long. 
an hour, an hour now. Hopefully, you're not all asleep. Um, any other plans tonight for some of you guys, or is um, is this it? I mean, this is obviously a very in, intriguing um, evening, and I'm sure you guys are um, thrilled to be here, as as I am. Um, but I'd love to hear what you guys have got planned for tonight and the weekend, um, if anything, or just a bit more relaxing. And maybe also, um, you know, who's been to Denmark? I know obviously some of those WA guys have, have probably been down here, but have any of you Eastern State guys um, been over this way? Thanks, David. Um, well, I mean, really, I've, I've really enjoyed tonight. I'm not too sure if you'd like me to keep carrying on, but an hour of, of looking at me on the computer is probably enough for most people. Um, I've certainly enjoyed being here and been uh, really enjoyed. Um, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to um, have, have the chance to chat to you and to talk about um, these two wines that we make. Um, obviously, two, two, two of um, a few wines that we do make for you guys, but um, <clears throat> two new releases anyway, which I think uh, are drinking really amazingly well now. Um, perfect for these this sort of um, sort of spring, sorry autumn um, autumn conditions that we're having. You know, great with food and um, obviously, uh, yeah, yeah, good cellaring wines too. So I appreciate your feedback and um, the ongoing support. I appreciate all the comments that I keep getting as well. I mean, every day we do see comments coming in a lot earlier and earlier. Um, in the past, obviously, you tend to see comments coming in the evening. However, um, I think through uh, more home isolation. We're seeing people you know, enjoying a couple of glasses at lunchtime, which is awesome. Um, yeah, as, as Australians, I think we should be enjoying wine at lunch as well. I think um, yeah, we should go and be doing a little bit more European. Uh, <laughs> we should be be a little bit more European our approach to to wine as well, and uh, and that's all about wine enjoyment and and just wine awareness as well. You know, um, yeah, a couple of glasses of wine at lunch is is actually, I think, great for you. And um, I mean, it does extend the day out a little bit, but you know, through these times, who cares? Um, so I just go through a few more comments here. Thanks, thanks, Santina. Thanks, Suzanne. I will, Santina. Santina says hi to the girls. Thanks very much. All right, goes well. Yeah, I think I'll um, I'll love love you and uh, and leave you there. I really appreciate you guys making the time to be here tonight. Um, I know there's a lot more awesome winemakers and wine tastings to come in the next few weeks. Uh, so I really yeah really look forward to seeing those. I'm going to be joining um, those as well and and looking forward to seeing what wines are being being tasted. Um, yeah, again, thank you so much for your support. Um, I really hope you guys are all staying safe and uh, and are happy as be as can be anyway now. Um, yeah, obviously tough times for everyone, um, but yeah, you know, having having you guys out there and the support of the naked community uh, means the world to us, and um, we're very grateful to 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 have you guys as our angels and to yeah you know, to, to to listen to and talk to, and um, it does feel like a a warm embrace from a wine loving community. So thank you very much for that. Um, and if you're ever down this way in Denmark, really look forward to seeing you. Um, yeah, give us a, a buzz beforehand or email. Always look forward to seeing uh, the naked guys down here and talking all things wine and, and drinking all things wine. Uh, anyway, uh, have a great weekend uh, wherever you are. And remember, drink naked and drink army of grapes and notice tollens. All right. Cheers. Bye.